and things like that uh, have significance to them. There's meaning behind it. There's doctrinal information for us to understand that will renew our mind and can have an effect if we allow it and enlarge ourselves to it, have an effect on our outward appearance and it be a godly outward appearance. And um, so we'll talk about all those things as we get in. Um, I'm going to um, just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll, I think one time I said we'll eventually get back to this passage in one of the Q&As, and then I never got back to it. Um, or I think that was Easter. We started out in Acts 17, and then after I got home, I'm like, I never even went back to Acts 17. So um, I just forget, to be honest. So uh, hopefully we'll come back here if I don't forget. Otherwise, you can shout out, what were you going to say about 1 Corinthians 9? Um, but we're just going to read verses um, 18 through 22. And hopefully we'll eventually get back to this passage, but we'll just utilize it to, for our reading, and then we'll pray and get into our Q&A time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might, that I might by all means save some. We're just going to read the rest of the chapter. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to open up this book, to look at a question. Uh, no matter what question it is, we understand that your word provides us an understanding to, for an answer to that question. And so we thank you for the living words of the living God, to have them live within us. And in regards to the tie, in, in regards to a robe, and in general, in regards to our outward appearance, uh, you have much to say on the matter. And so, Father, may we do all things, uh, do all to the glory of God, whether we eat or drink or what it is, what we wear, how it is, uh, uh, how we wear it, and, and all those questions regarding our outward appearance, may they uh, be cultivated and may they be generated by a sincerity, by a pure conscience, and by the issue of understanding godliness. And therefore, this is, uh, again, an important question for us to look at, and uh, we thank you again for the time to, to do so, to look at it, uh, and to uh, gain some understanding. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the time that we have together around your word, uh, studying it, thinking upon it, and uh, coming to understand more and more about you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Um, obviously, when I first read the, read, read the question, um, why do you wear a tie, um, I just want to personally give my reason why I wear a tie, and then my reason is more specific based upon certain passages like we just read. Um, and so I'll eventually get back to that. And then you read the secondary question. I, I don't know who, who writes these questions, and that's, that's fine. Um, I asked to put the name on there just so I could clarify, but that's okay too. Um, but the secondary question, why not a robe, you can kind of see the, uh, maybe what's getting at. Um, so my immediate thoughts went to the issue of the Levitical priesthood uh, in regards to what they wore in the Old Testament under the law. Um, my, also, my mind went to one of the, the denominations or religions that is involved in wearing robes is Catholicism, Lutheranism. Um, and so to kind of differentiate between, okay, well, if you're going to wear a tie, you're going to dress up some, well, why not do the whole kit and caboodle? 
You know, why not dress up in the robe, the whole, uh, uh, the whole thing? Um, my, the most fundamental answer, you can come with me to Romans chapter 6, where we've been at uh, for a long time. Well, not in chapter 6, but chapter 7. In regards to why not a robe, one, if the question pertains to the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, which we'll look at, um, one is we're not a kingdom of priests. Uh, we're not to be. We're not the priesthood of God today in this dispensation of grace, and therefore um, we don't operate in regards to the law in that fashion. Um, and that's what Paul begins to teach. He explains and amplifies upon it throughout his epistles. But as he starts fundamentally here in Romans 6, a passage that we're very familiar with, verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, again, in this context, he's dealing with the law in connection with its relationship to sin. But its, its influence of not being under the law reaches out to many things that was taking place uh, under the law. And um, one of those things is the, the decoration, and it was a, a holy decoration of the priests in Israel's program. Uh, but with what Paul says, we're not under law, but under grace. We understand, especially here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, that there's a change in program to this dispensation of grace compared to what God was doing in time past and what he'll do in the future with Israel in the ages to come. And because we're not a kingdom of priests, we're not the priesthood of God, um, or, or any of those things that are explained back here in the Old Testament or explained by Peter and 1 Peter and 2 Peter. We are members of the church, the body of Christ. And therefore our vocation and our purpose is, is it, there's a similarity between the, the body of Christ and the priesthood in regard to ruling with Christ in our respective realms. However, the difference is the respective realms. Uh, the heaven and earth, and we are the body, and therefore our functionality and what is taught to us by the Apostle Paul differs from what was taught to Israel in time past and what is going to be taking place even in that kingdom. But I want you to look at it. I don't want to just talk about it. Uh, come with me to Exodus 28 and see kind of the, some of the instruction that was given to Israel regarding uh, the, the priesthood decor and robes and garments and things like that. Look at Exodus 28, and we'll start here in verse 1. <coughs> Exodus 28, in verse 1, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And you can go on and read more about that. But what God had is he had filled some people in Israel with a spirit of wisdom, not in regards to tabernacle building, oh he did, but not these specific ones, but in regards to the outward, uh, 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 outward appearance of those in Aaron's office, the priests. And you can see here, I, I, the passage here in verse 2 is, is actually quite wonderful. He says, and thou shalt make holy garments. Now you have to understand what makes them holy, first and foremost. The fact that they're going to wear garments of this name doesn't mean that they're, they're holy. But because of the, when, when you talk about holiness, that's, that's, a, 
that's a distinction between things that are unholy. There's things in regards to God that, remember, delight Him, they please Him, they satisfy Him. And that reaches, if you remember that passage we looked, I think it was over in Zechariah, when, way back, when we were doing Romans 6, and we were dealing with the, the overall concept of holiness. And in the kingdom here, they're going to, the Gentiles are going to come on horses and, and, and cattle and those type of things, and they're going to have bells, and, and it's going to be holiness unto the Lord. And the vessels, basically the vessels that will uh, support plants and, and other vessels in regards to what they put in, they put in them, they're going to be holy unto the Lord. They're going to be things that delight and please Him and satisfy Him. The same is true with these holy garments. For Aaron, thy brother, and what are they going to be for? For glory and for beauty. These robes, these garments, not only are they going to be beautiful, but when you talk about the issue of holiness, their beauty and their glory are going to be vastly different than the garments and the robes and the, uh, the, the apparel that is worn by the Gentiles that surround them. Everything... Everything in that law, is, we're learning it's holy, just, and good, but the things in that law in regards to what they were to eat and what not to eat, what they were to wear and what not to wear, were supposed to be holy. And not only holy because of who God is, but holy in connection with their distinction and their separateness from what the Gentiles wore. And hopefully, maybe that triggers something in your mind regard to what Paul says. When God gives the law to Israel, and in that law includes the apparel of the priests, and it's holy, distinct from the world, there's something under grace as well that Paul is going to come out and he says, and be not conformed to this world. There's a way the world Dresses. I'm just trying to make the connection. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not necessarily uh, talking about the the hard distinction right now. That's what last lesson was for to talk about the difference between law and grace. I'm trying to show the the issue of the the, the similarity in, in both. When Paul says, "And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind," the world dresses a certain way. But the renewing of our mind is going to provide for us, obviously, not to be dressed, but it's going to provide for us to wear certain apparel that is consistent with who we are in Christ. And everything you do is impacted by the renewing of your mind. What you eat, what you wear, where you go, what you do, what you think. The renewing of your mind is all encompassing of your life. That's why he says over in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And we know that all things work together for good. All things. And just as God, as you can see back here in the law, and we'll eventually look at some passages with Paul, is... Maybe concerned isn't the right word, but um, just to, to state it, is concerned about all of, of the things of our life, even what we wear. And what we wear is, again, to be consistent with what Paul teaches. And he's going to talk about it throughout his epistles. Now... Again, as we see back here in Exodus 28, that the priests specifically were to make holy garments, or they were to have holy garments uh, for that brother, and they were to be for glory and for beauty. And that's what they were making. In verse 4, look at verse 4 again. And these are the garments what they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitar and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, and he shall minister unto me in the priest's office. Not only were these, these, this apparel that the priests were wearing different from the Gentiles around them, but it also 
uh, signified who they were amongst the tribe of Israel. And it showed them that they were the Levitical priesthood. They, remember, the Levites didn't have an inheritance. Their inheritance was the Lord. They didn't have land. They, had, they, had, they were the ones worshiping and serving and, and mediating on behalf of the rest of the, the, the 11 tribes between the 11 tribes and God. That was their inheritance. That, that was their role in Israel. And their clothing signified that. It outwardly manifested their role within the nation of Israel. And that's important too, because those concepts also carry over. Look at a little more of this. Look at Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. In God, how do I want to put it? God esteemed and validated the significance of these garments. Um, we'll, we'll see that. If, if not, I'll bring it up. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 3. Thus shall Aaron come unto the holy place, into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen coat. And he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. And he shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Come with me to Numbers chapter 20. Look at, look at this passage. Numbers chapter 20. There came a point when Aaron was to die because of his disobedience, but he didn't die until after he took off his attire, after he took off his garments. Look at Numbers 20, look at verse 26. Um, let's pick it up, verse 22. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. And, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up unto Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar his son, and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. Now he, he had already rebelled. But he has been able to live, in my understanding, is because of the garments. But look what takes place. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, the rest of verse 26, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them uh, uh, upon Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount. So it wasn't he came down from the mountain, but he died on the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And when the whole congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. Now, there's a lot of symbology and typology that that's, can, we can talk about here, but just in regards to the garments back here and the robes and what they were wearing had significance, especially in the tribe of Levi, in regards to their Levitical priesthood. Now, this issue, you have to understand with all that God's doing, and this is an important issue, with what Israel was to eat and not to eat, and what they were to wear and what not to wear, as well as the, the, the Levitical priesthood, and what, and what they were supposed to do when they went into a certain nation and what they were not supposed to do, and what they, who they were supposed to marry and, and not marry. All these things had a doctrinal significance to them. They had a a doctrine behind them that if you understood and you kept the doctrine behind them, even though it's an outward issue of, of, of conduct and behavior, is, uh, God would look at that and bless that and, and esteem that pleasing in his sight. But if Israel would, would, would not understand and, and, and take away the doctrinal significance of these things, basically they would strip the work from the doctrine. Well, now you just have a work with no doctrinal significance behind it. 
And remember, the law was a, was a schoolmaster to teach them something. It was to educate them in something. But if you take the schoolmaster away from the law, all you have is the work. And that's one of the ways in which God, when, when Israel would do the work, if that doctrinal significant issue was behind the work, that was pleasing to God. If it was stripped from it, then it wasn't. And you can see this throughout Israel's history. We're not going to look at it. I'll just make mention of it right now. God told Israel to sacrifice. That was to teach them, obviously, about eventually Christ. And it was just an education of, you need to sacrifice. I'm telling you what to sacrifice. And he even taught them with, with Abraham, I am your sacrifice. And in order for us to have our sins, you have to recognize I'm a sinner and, and you're righteous. And, and that's, that's the teaching behind the sacrifice. Now, if you rip that teaching from the sacrifice, all you have is a bloody goat. And it came a point in Israel's history that, and you can see as we've been going through our Bible survey on Thursdays, that they would get so far, they, wouldn't, they lose the law a few times in their history. They're not reading that law, so they can't even get the doctrinal significance, but yet they're still doing the work. Where it comes a point when you get to that fifth course of punishment and you're reading in Isaiah and he comes along and, and says, your sacrifices are smoke in my nose. I got to get away from this. Well, wait a minute. Before he told them to sacrifice. And before it was pleasing in his sight. And now later on in their history, they're sacrificing. Yet he's saying it's a smoke under his nose. And, and, and those passages, if you ever read them, they, they whoa, 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 wait a minute, I don't get this. Because what was behind it, it was supposed to school them and teach them in something. And if they rip that teaching from the sacrifice, that's all it is. It's a sacrifice. Same thing with the garments. They could have the garments, but they're supposed to teach Israel something about God. But if you, reach, if you rip the teaching from what's, what's behind the garment and what it's supposed to be teaching them about, it's just the garment. And that's where Israel got. Come with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of Israel at this time now. Matthew 23 and look at verse... We'll start here in verse 1. He said, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' Moses's seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Here's, here's, here's what, I'm, what I just got done talking about, okay? Look at the Pharisees and the scribes and the Pharisees. They sit in Moses' seat. Everything that they bid you observe, that observe and do. But look, what, look at the caveat he's going to give them. But do not ye after their works. Wait, he just told them to do what they did. He's not telling them not to do certain things that they're bidding you to do. But what he's saying is don't do it after how they're doing it. And what he's talking about is what's behind it all. Look what he goes on to say. For they say... And do not. There's, a, there's an outward appearance, but there, there are some things that they say, but they're not, actually, it's, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Look at verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Not only that, but look at, look at some of their works. And this is, goes into the, the garment situation. But all their works, here it is, they do, and this, the next one, two, three, four, five, six words are what's behind what they're doing. But all their works, they do for to be seen of who? Amen. See, it wasn't that, and I, the, you're not dealing with the, the priests here, and with the Pharisees and Sadducees, but even if they came along as the leaders identified themselves differently than the rest of the people by what they wore, if they did it with the, not to the issue of be seen of men, but because of what, was, what should be behind that, 
the teaching, whatever that is, we're, I'm just talking s- simply right now, the motivation and the, the, the constraining and, and what's behind them doing this, if that's right, then that can be pleasing unto God. And again, that's one of the things that we've been talking about regarding the law. The law, it schooled them in fundamental things about God, but it didn't provide enough for their spirit. It didn't provide them enough information to look at it, gather it, say, this is why we do what we do. And that's what God's grace is going to provide us for. But look at what they do. Verse 5 again. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. He goes on. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets to be called of men rabbi, rabbi. But be... But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth. They like to be called father. For one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters. They like to be called masters as well. For one, imagine if I said, hey, come on, guys. Call me your master. Come on. Oh, my goodness. Ain't they taking the glory from God? Yeah, that's exactly what's, that's exactly what's doing it. Neither uh, be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And then he goes on and he starts giving the woes uh, to them, and that it, they're, they're fools, the Pharisees and scribes, and they're blind leaders of the blind, and they, they've turned light into darkness, and darkness to light, and, and a, a whole host of things that they've done. But that whole issue of their garments, it, it, it's like they take, I'm just, I'm just using it in, in, in kind of the uh, example. It's like they take what was given to the priests, and they just make them bigger. <laughs> they enlarge the borders so they can be seen of men. And especially if, if you have the priests still following what they're supposed to wear. And then you have the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and, and all the... They're going to come along and, and, well, you got some competition. How they would look at it. Well, let's make ours bigger so we can be seen. And they're one of the most influ- influential leaders in Israel, these Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and, and, and this, this group of people. Well, it's, that's, that's what ends up happening. You take the teaching from... What is from the, the, the outward appearance or the conduct or the, whatever it is, and now you just have a conduct, and, and because you rip it from your teaching, now you can add to it. And their motive was replaced for the proper teaching behind it. And their, what, what constrained them, and, they, and, and their motive was to be seen of men. So what did that lead to? Well, not having their garments the way maybe the, even equalizing themselves with the, the priests, but what, how they, they enlarged their garments, made broad their phylacteries. And you end up in a position that is displeasing to God and you're in a position that, and they're not even wanting to please God. They want to be seen of men. But that's where they end up being. Come with me to Luke 20, look at this again. Luke 20. Luke 20 and verse 46. Start in verse 45. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love meetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers the same shall receive greater damnation. You have a parallel passage there, like there in Matthew chapter 23. And so again, I just trying to show you, first of all, under the law, God had them have holy garments, and they're, they're holy not only for glory and beauty as far as their outward uh, appearance and look, but what was behind it was the significance, and what it was supposed to teach them was significant. You get, if you get holy garments and they're called holy, you're getting them from a holy God. 
the holy God. But if you strip that teaching, you strip down whatever it was supposed to teach, and all you have left is the outward appearance and the, and the outward conduct, it's not attached to any teaching or doctrine. Well, now it's just of your flesh, and you can add to it, change it, and it's going to change. It's no longer going to be holy. They're going to change the actual outward appearance of, of, of their attire and their, their apparel. And that, therefore, it would become displeasing to God. And that would start to line up with the world system, and that would become an abomination to the Lord, based upon the wisdom of men. But, when you get to Paul's epistles, and even out here, when Israel, the little flock, is starting to experience the benefits of the new covenant, which is the issue of God doing for them, providing for their spirit information, so that their conduct and behavior isn't of the flesh, and, but is, it gives them enough to operate upon so that the, what, the works that they're involved in are pleasing unto God and holy unto God. Same is true with us in regards to the way in which it operates. Now, the teachings are different, but God's grace has now provided information for us to have our mind renewed, and not just a fundamental teaching like the law provided, but, in, but adult teaching, that's that spirit issue, lowercase s, that pro he provides for us that by it renews our mind and will produce a change in conduct and behavior in the case in which we're looking at what we wear. And this is specifically, not only, but specifically highlighted for believing justified women today. Come with me real quick and look at Look at some things. Look at 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2. Paul's dealing with the conduct and behavior of men and women in the assembly. Um, he deals with the he deals with all all the people in verses one through seven, and then in verses eight he deals with the men, and then nine through fifteen he deals with the the women. And look at where he says in verse nine. He says, "In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel." with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. In regards to the adorning of women today, as far as believers, it's supposed to be done in modest apparel, with shamefacedness. That shamefacedness, I, I, immediately when I see the word, I think of, of, of blushing. But when you look at the, the definition of it, it's, a, it's the issue of an excess of modesty. Now, the privilege that we have as sons and daughters today in this dispensation of grace is that modesty and the excess of modesty is proved by the individual. In other words, ladies, it's you take God's word in regards to the instruction he gives you regarding your adornment, and you choose, as you go shopping, and this is for men too, but as you talk about women here, you choose, as you go shopping or in your closet, you choose what's modest and what's shamefacedness. And that ness is the state and condition of. That's what you're supposed to write. That's, that's what walking consistent with who you are in Christ, this is what it would look like as far as what I wear. And then he says, and sobriety. I love that word sobriety. Because that, that sobriety, that's the issue of, of soberness. Your apparel and adornment is not only thinking about you and what you like and dislike, 
It's thinking about others. Come with me. Hold your hand here and come with me to Romans 12. The first time Paul brings up that issue of soberness and our godly edification is right at the get-go. That good is eventually going to be glory here. It reaches even to what we wear. To where he can come along in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and summarize for women how they're to adorn themselves. Come back to that passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 9 again, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but what are they to adorn themselves with? But, take out the parentheses, but with what? Good words. If you want to have the mind of Christ, God's mind, in regards to what you're supposed to adorn yourself with, first of all, as far as outwardly, it's modest apparel, but the modest apparel has doctrinal significance behind it. And what's behind the modest apparel is the issue of putting the focus on where it's supposed to be, the good works. You're supposed to adorn yourself with good work. He doesn't say you're not supposed to adorn yourself with nothing. What he's saying is the, you wear modest apparel, adorn yourself with modesty and that shamefacedness and sobriety, and, but the focus is supposed to be the good works. The, what, you're, what the woman is doing. Isn't that the opposite of, of our culture today? Our culture today in regards to women is not what they do, but what they wear. How they look. The issue isn't upon what they're involved with. And, and in fact, what they're involved in, or if they give to a charity, that's the icing on the cake. That's the bonus. That's supposed to be the sum and substance of who they are. And the modest apparel is supposed to give credence to the good works, not the other way around. Now, come with me to another passage. Um, Come real quick with me and just, just to briefly touch upon it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now this is true of men too. And we'll, we'll deal with this here and uh, deal with that in a second. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and just quickly come with me to verse 29. In the context, he's talking about marriage, remarriage, and divorce, and all these, uh, these issues, and uh, talking about engagement, or how we would call it. Um, Paul calls it the issue of being loose or bound, and, and those, type of, those, type, that, those type of words. Brings up the virgin here. But in the middle of it, he kind of interjects in verse 29. He says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they we wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it. And then look at his, his last statement here. For the fashion of this world, what? Pass it away. Remember the issue of back over there in Romans chapter 6, the issue of the, our ability to bring forth fruit unto holiness and the end of it everlasting life? What he's talking about is the world and the fashion of the world. Now, he's not simply talking about the way in which we think about fashion and our you know, fashion design and fashion clothes and all this stuff. But fashion is the issue of what's, what prevails at a specific point in time. And whether it's Corinthian culture or our culture today, the fashion of this world is going to pass away. The issue that we are to be focused upon is godliness, and it, it, that doesn't mean it doesn't affect what we wear, but what we wear and how we wear it, how our hair looks and, and, and all these things have a, ought to have a bearing upon the truth of, of, of what we've come to learn and understand. And it ought to be different than the world. Now, I'm not saying... Because no one wears robes today, go get a robe or something. I'm not saying that. But there is a fashion of this world. So, something that prevails. We're, uh, don't worry, no one be alarmed. 
We just got pizza cooking in the back there. So all you on the internet, you're missing out, but we're going to have some pizza afterwards. Anyways, there's a fashion in this world, and it passeth away. And so the, the issue as adult son and daughters, we are to recognize what that fashion is and be able to distinguish ourselves from because we know that passeth away and, and go after the issue of godliness and the, that good works. Um, come with me. There was more of this going on in the Corinthian culture. Um, come over with me to chapter 11. This is a passage that's often confused a lot in Christianity. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I've got to hurry up here. Let me give you an example of how this all works. And we talked about it first in regards to godliness, the thinking, living, and laboring in the first session. Well, here you have another example of that very thing. Look what he says here in verse 1 of chapter 11. He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Verse 3. But I, would not have, uh, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Paul sets forth there in verse 3 the, the structural the structural authority between not only God and, and uh, himself, the Father, and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but also in connection with Christ and man, and man and, and woman. And that structural design of authority is supposed to aid and guide and renew your mind in connection with what you wear. Look at this. This is, this is a passage oftentimes we just simply go over. This passage is very influential, especially, again, for women. Verse 4. He says, Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now, when he talks about the covering here, you have to understand what he's talking about. Now, jump down. He's going to sum it all up. When you jump down the verse, a lot of people think this is the this is the, the covering of, you know, the, what you see in some religions in, in uh, Islam and things, and the women have their, co their covering. Now, he's not talking about a, a shawl or whatever they call it. He's talking about hair. <laughs> and look at this. Look at how he summarizes this all up. Look at verse 14. Same passage, when he gets down to the end, he says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have, what? Long hair... It is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a what? Covering. A hair is a covering. So when he talks about the head being covered here, starting at verse 4, no, he's talking about hair. Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered. What is he talking about? A man having, is he talking about having hair? Or what kind of hair? Long hair. He says, dishonoreth his head. He's taking the actual length of hair and saying there's an issue of a renewed mind behind that in connection with the structural authority. If a man has long hair, he's dishonoring his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a lot more to all this, but godliness and grace doesn't come along and just simply say, oh, these things are not issues. But it gives you the spirit behind how you dress and, and do your hair and those type of things. Look at verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her hair or with her head uncovered, which would mean what? Without long hair, <laughs> dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, you can tell in the Corinthian culture that there was an issue of women having their hair real short and even shaved. And that, that's, I don't want to say creeping, 
because it's probably been here for a while, but in our culture today, you, you see some of this stuff again. You see, I'm embarrassed to know this information, but the, the, the Miley Cyrus, if you know who that is, Billy Ray Cyrus' his daughter, my Achy Break Your Heart, everyone's heard that song, right? Come on, Achy Break Your Heart. No? Oh, man. Good. That's probably, that's probably, his daughter shaves her head or just part of it or has a mohawk and it, it, it's like my head. That's the Corinthian culture in effect in, in our day. And now, I don't know if she's, a, she's saved or not, whatever. I'm not going to speculate. I don't mean to get into any of that. But I'm just saying the same thing was happening today or back in this day. And Paul's utilizing godliness to renew the mind of the women in Corinth and the men in Corinth to have their apparel, their adornment, their attire, and also their, the hair on their head reflect that of the structural stature of the authority that God has placed within mankind. And going against that goes against the, the structural authority that God has placed within mankind. He goes on, look at what he says here, verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. He goes right there, he gives the instruction, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Why? For as much as he is the image and glory of God. The fact that man is the image and glory of God, that's why you are not to cover your head. You're not supposed to have long hair. Now there's more into understanding all of that, but that, that's, that's exactly what he's saying. Verse 8, for the man is not of the woman. I'm sorry, uh, look at verse, the rest of verse 7. But the woman is the glory of the man. So how a woman and how a man are supposed to wear their hair are supposed to be different because man and woman are different. And I know our culture says different today, but it's not. It's not supposed to be that way. And everything with homosexuality and same-sex marriage and all this stuff that's coming in, it's creeping into the culture in regards to the, the sexuality of men and women and both how men dress and how women dress and how the hair is worn. And there's a lot of that stuff that is just prevailing out there today that many believers are conformed to. And the issue is, is us to not be conformed to this world. He goes on. I'm not trying to re reprove or rebuke anyone. I'm just saying this, this is what the, the scriptures teach. Every, we're supposed to take this information and individually, you're supposed to prove it in your own life. Look what he goes on to say, verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the who? Wow. That, to me, is fascinating. Not only does he call long hair power, but he also, he, he also in connection with it, says because of the angels. How what we wear and, and our hair educates angels. Never thought it mattered much, did you? The fact our education of angels not only goes in regards to the hidden mystery, it goes into the issue of the mystery of godliness. And the issue of godliness and the thinking the way God thinks. And when he created man and when he took woman from man and, and therefore made woman, there was a difference and that was supposed to be highlighted in what each wore and, and the, the reflection of their, how they wore their hair. And again, that's what this, this passage teaches. Verse 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. There's, there it is. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? You're supposed to take the information and buy it. Judge in yourselves. Doth not even nature, and he goes on and talks about that. But look at what he does in verse 16. He says, but if any man seem to be contentious, contentious we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And as we conclude, there's more to be talked upon this, but our time is up. We conclude, that will segue into why I wear a tie. 
When he says there, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. I have chosen not to wear a suit and a dress up and a tie. One, because of what the way in which our society is in regards to teachers of God's word. Often, if they're not in some sense dressed up, will actually hinder them from hearing what's coming out of the mouth. Yet at the same time, I'm not dressing up in a robe. <laughs> and I, in my responsibility as a son myself, have judged to dress up enough I think, and maybe I could be wrong, but I think if it was simply everyone here in this room this morning, that most of you, maybe not, I wouldn't mind if I came in a t-shirt and shorts. Because you all know what the most important thing is, which is what? The Word of God. However, because we never know who's going to come through that door and therefore would have a dynamic of having a stronger and weaker brother, we as believers don't want to put a stumbling block in the way of anyone in regards to hearing the truth. And as Paul says, we didn't get to the passages in regards to he, when he talks about eating that which is offered to idols and not and he says, if my, my weaker brother stumbleth at what I eat that's offered and sacrificed to idols, he says, if he stumbleth, he says, Paul says, while the world standeth, I will not eat anything that's offered unto idols because I care so much for that, that, that brother. And that's my attitude in regards to anyone who would step through that door is they wouldn't first see me in a robe to highlight the issue. It's not what you wear but also not go to the other extreme of wearing a t-shirt and shorts. I'm not saying you guys don't. You, I'm not saying this is for you. I'm saying as the, as the pastor and teacher here, don't wear shorts and a t-shirt, but to dress up somewhere in the middle so that one, the, that stance of the truth is made in regards to it's not what you wear that counts, but also not hinder them from hearing what's going to come from this book that I have the privilege of teaching. And that's why I don't wear a robe, that's why I wear a tie, but I am happy afterwards to take it off. Um, I'm not a big dress up guy. I'm, I'm a, what they would call in college and high school, a baller. I played basketball, so I was the, I was the guy at college who always wore sweatpants, mostly. Um, so I enjoy my sweatpants, I enjoy my shirts and t-shirt, my sandals when it's nice out, and I don't like going outside when it's cold. But, um, but hopefully that not only just answers the question, but gives you a little bit more background regarding our outward appearance matters, and it can be consistent with who we are in Christ, and it can be inconsistent with who we are in Christ. And it's a passage like we just saw there in 1 Corinthians 11, and 1 Timothy 2, and again, I would stress, I know the woman is brought up, and there's a reason why, but also the man, the, what we wear has, has impact uh, as well. And so um, those things are supposed to be generated from being renewed in godliness um, in, in what God's word has taught us. I'll conclude in prayer, and I'll also pray for um, our fellowship afterwards. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word. And look at this issue of apparel and attire and look at in regards to what we wear. And may we judge in ourselves individually and uh, manifest and represent your grace and who you've made us to be in Christ in a worthy manner. Uh, in a worthy manner that we don't have to think upon uh, totally in and of ourselves. You leave us the liberty and the responsibility to prove it, but also you give us information to have our mind renewed uh, like these passages that we looked at and how they, how what we wear, or at least what we're, it's supposed to, what we wear and uh, how our, the, our hair is, um, is supposed to reflect the creative design 
that you've placed uh, between the man and the woman. And not only that, but uh, also the, the authority that has been placed between uh, God, you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ and man, and man and woman. And um, Father, we thank you that we can come to understand these things, not in a, a grudgingly type of way, but because of an honesty of heart that we have to, to look at these things and want to be conformed to, to your image uh, through the instrumentality of the godly edification uh, that you have placed in the doctrine of Paul's epistles. And so as we start to have our mind renewed, that we have a, a spirit, a lowercase s, behind our actual outward appearance, those are the things uh, that please you. Um, and may we do it through the, the motivation and the constraining of your words to renew us and to change um, what we wear and, and those type of things, as well as all things in life. Uh, we, Father, we thank you for the effectual working of your word and the power that's contained therein to, to change something such as this. And um, Father, may we uh, not be beguiled by this world, not be duped by it, uh, as the world is oftentimes we later find out deeply ingrained into our mind and our heart. And may we uh, desire to root those things out, to not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that renewing of our mind takes place through the dispensing of your mind to us through these words. So Father, we give you all the thanks and praise. We thank you for this time of fellowship we can have uh, hereafter as we participate in getting to know one another and that, uh, again, as, as uh, we look at these things, may these things saturate our conversation and may we edify one another in godliness. And Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how they died for our sins, was buried and rose again. If no one, someone here or listening has not trusted the gospel of Christ, then that, that very, th those very things, may they believe this very moment so they can be justified unto eternal life and possess as a present possession the gift of eternal life. May they do so right now. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. Again, we don't give grudgingly or on necessity. We give in connection with the effectual working of your word in us and the grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. It's in your name we pray. Amen.